Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Today we're going to talk about a number of headlines directly and indirectly related to Bible prophecy. So let's dig right in. The first one I want to pull up for you today, this is from Zero Hedge. It's titled, European Corn Yields Expected to Plunge Amid Worst Drought in 500 Years. It says, besides the news, of record high electricity prices, a troubling new crop failure report about Europe's upcoming harvest was published Monday. The bloc's monitoring agricultural resources forecasted corn yields could drop by nearly a fifth due to a devastating drought, according to Bloomberg. And we went over some of that last week in a video. It goes on, they talk about some of the uh, hunger stones that we've talked about previously, so I want to skip over that and get to this. It says, the plunge and corn output could result in further food inflation. It will boost feed costs for livestock herds, adding to even more woes for farmers who are plagued with elevated diesel and fertilizer prices. And I would add, and government policies on top of it, because we've seen what's going on in the Netherlands, Canada, a whole bunch of countries within Europe on that front. Water and stre heat stress periods partly coincided with the sensitive flowering stage and grain filling, according to the crop monitoring report. This resulted in irreversibly lost yield potential. And here they provide a snapshot of a tweet that says, this is Europe's future. Corn that dried out before it could grow to be harvested as far as the eyes can see. So, and then they go on, they, they hashtag drought and this as well. And let me tell you, as we see these crop failures, because we went over this last week, we're going to see these estimates for crop production for corn, wheat, rice, soybeans be moved downward and downward and downward up until the day of the harvest. And when it turns out, when, when everybody knows how devastating this is for world food supply, they're going to blame this right here and the politicians are going to use that to take away more freedom and liberty and to take greater control away from us away from us so be on the lookout for that but this you know this is this drought that's taking place in Europe this goes beyond crop yields it impacts energy as well it's exacerbating that problem because the hydropower isn't able to be generated the way it was before nuclear power is not able to be generated the way it was before. We're seeing hundreds of towns in France that are without water and have to have it trucked in. And of course, trucking that in uses energy that otherwise wouldn't need to be used. So we're seeing these out of control problems in Europe. It's, it's just terrible right now, but it's a global, this drought is a global issue as evidenced by this next article. This is about China. It says, China's biggest lake shrinks to 25% of normal size as drought afflicts a main rice growing area. So we're seeing a theme here. First it's corn, now it's rice. With China's biggest freshwater lake reduced to just 25% of its usual size by a severe drought, work crews are digging trenches to keep water flowing to one of the country's main rice growing regions. The dramatic decline of Poyang Lake in the landlocked so southeastern province of Zhengxi had otherwise cut off irrigation channels to nearby farmlands. The crews using excavators to dig trenches only work after dark because of the extreme daytime heat. The severe heat wave is wreaking havoc across much of southern China. High temperatures have sparked mountain fires that have forced evacuations, and factories have been ordered to cut production as hydroelectric plants reduce their output amid drought conditions. The extreme heat and drought have wilted crops and shrunk rivers, disrupting cargo traffic. So we're seeing the same thing take place in China that we've been seeing take place in Europe, this massive drought. It's affecting not just crop yields, but hydroelectric power, the ability to use waterways to transport goods. So this is going to have huge economic impacts. It's, it's going to have a huge impact on food inflation. And they mentioned rice here. We aren't getting any 
projections or estimates in regard to how this drought is going to impact the rice crop. But we do know that China is the world's number one producer of rice. So if they have a huge shortfall, that's going to need to be made up somewhere else. And we already know from last week that the number one exporter of rice in the world and the second largest population nation in the world, India, is experiencing issues with their rice crop. And they expect that production will be down at least 8% as we go into harvest. We've seen four, what was it, four of the top five producers of rice are experiencing issues right now. So we'll keep our eyes on this. This is going to exacerbate the food crisis. And of course, this drought isn't limited to just China and Europe. It's also in the United States, as we see here from this article in Pro Farmer. Now, right now, as of yesterday, today, tomorrow, and the next day, they're going to have agricultural experts fanning out into the cornfields of the United States to do these annual crop tours. So we're going to really have a good idea at the end of this week what the corn crop in the United States is going to look like. We won't know for sure until harvest, but we'll have a much better idea than the overly optimistic USDA projections, which have just been based on farmer surveys from months ago and acreage planted versus what is the yield on that because we, we need to take into account fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides either used or not used, irrigation, what are the impacts of the weather, all of, the, all of these different factors that go into the quality of what's being grown and if it's being grown at all. And so here are real live people going out into the fields and finding that. So we read from here, it says, day one is complete. The tour made its way through Ohio, South Dakota, and the first half of Nebraska and Indiana. We have 90 scouts on the crop tour with us this year, and we can't thank them enough for all their efforts this week. Let's dive into the numbers. We'll save the good for later and talk about South Dakota corn first. Total yield average from the 71 samples pulled was 118.45 bushels per acre, which is 21.8% less than last year and 26.7% less than the three-year average. The biggest surprise through South Dakota was just how bad the drought stress is affecting the crop potential. The stress started early in the year with a rough planting season followed by little rain in June and July. We observed many barren plants with no ears. As they go out into these fields, they're seeing what the real quality impact is of these droughts. And this hasn't, this isn't in the USDA numbers yet. And it's going to be coming out in those numbers in the weeks and months ahead. And people are going to wake up to the reality. The harvest this year is not going to be what they thought it would be. It just simply isn't. So as we traveled through about 60% of the corn acres in South Dakota and crop district, five, six, and nine. The area that we have not toured seems to have a better outlook than the southeast corner. Now I'd like to know is that because people have been there or is it because they're going on projections that are based on what was produced last year? So I, I don't know the answer to that. It would be nice to know that. Observations from outside the tour area will be taken into consideration when Pro Farmer puts their analysis on the state averages on Thursday night to be released Friday afternoon. The pod counts in South Dakota are down 9% from what we observed last year and 12.6% from the three-year average. The bean crop is hurting with burned up edges and fewer pods per node than what we normally observe. Nodes are farther apart than normal and any remaining flowers were burned up. Most years we say a soybean crop can still be made if a rain comes, but after seeing the South Dakota crop, I'm not sure if that's the case. So what they saw in the first day of these crop tours, it's, it's not good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to push these estimates down, just like we went over last week when I put out the warning about the food shortages that are coming. This is happening not just in the United States, it's happening everywhere in the world. There's only a handful of countries that are going to be increasing production, a handful that are of, of any node anyway. So the major producers of corn, wheat, and rice are collectively 
going to be down this year. And that's going to have a huge impact on food inflation and really famine and starvation. That's something that Jesus talked about as a sign of his coming. So prepare yourselves now. We've been over this before. Prepare yourself, your family, your neighbors, your community. Do everything you can to be in a position of strength to be able to help others when everybody wakes up to the reality of what we're dealing with probably here in a, anywhere from a few weeks to a few months from now. So let's move on to our next story. This one comes from Summit News. It says World Economic Forum suggests there are solid rational reasons for children to be microchipped. Sounds great. Now, doing, not doing their bond villain reputation status any favors, the World Economic Forum published an article suggesting it would be a solid, rational move for children to be implanted with microchips. <laughs> yes, really, the idea is promoted in a blog post on the Davos Elite's website, which discusses the future of augmented reality and an augmented society. Quote, as scary as chip in implants may sound, they form part of a natural evolution that wearables once underwent. Hearing aids or glasses no longer carry a stigma, the article argues, perhaps forgetting that glasses and hearing aids aren't embedded inside the body, nor can they be controlled by outside forces. They are accessories and are even considered a fashion item. Likewise, implants will evolve into a commodity, writes scientist Kathleen Phillips, suggesting that mainstream culture and influencers will be tapped to promote implantable chips as a trendy status symbol. The article pushes the notion that augmented humans are inevitable and that global elites need to establish a power monopoly over the technology in order to ethically regulate it. We went over this too in past video on transhumanism and Bible prophecy and some of the beliefs that are held within the transhumanist movement, and particularly with the World Economic Forum promoting and advocating for those ideas. So this shouldn't come as any surprise. And then we scroll down a little bit further and we see another quote from Phillips that says, should you implant a tracking chip in your child, asked the scientist, adding there are solid, rational reasons for it, like safety. <laughs> so. You know, need I remind said scientists of, and I'm going to paraphrase this quote here from Benjamin Franklin, who said, he who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little bit of temporary safety deserves neither. So the people that are doing things like this in an effort to make themselves safer are simply going to imprison and enslave themselves in the end. This is... This is not where we should be going. This is toward a bad place. So on to the next story. We're going to talk about, this is from the UK Guardian. It says, libraries and museums to be warm havens for people struggling with energy bills. Ministers ask for funding to cope with the rise and the number of visitors seeking shelter this winter. Britain's libraries and museums are preparing to act as warm havens for people unable to afford to heat their homes in the winter months. Ministers are being called on to provide urgent new funding so public buildings can cope with a surge in visitors during the coldest months. The buildings will be part of a network across the country which will provide warm shelter to help reduce excess winter deaths linked to freezing conditions. So let's put that in plain English. What that means is, well, people are going to freeze to death this winter, so we're going to try to provide them with some community venues and places where they can go to get warm because, and help. Notice how it says not end, but reduce excess winter deaths linked to freezing conditions. So that doesn't sound like they're preparing for a very happy winter in the UK. And we're reading the same thing when we go over to Germany. This says, German official offered to wipe with cloth instead of shower. Winfred Kreschmann, Green Party Chancellor of the state of Baden-Württemberg, Germany, as part of saving electricity and gas, offers to heat just one room in his house and wipe with a damp cloth instead of shower. Quote, 
The washcloth is a useful invention, Kreischmann said. According to the politician, this way you can stop, quote, showering all the time, right? <laughs> So this is, this is this guy's solution. This is a person in power, a person of power, who thinks this is a legitimate response to the energy crisis he and his friends have created. They've put, they've put Europe in this, in this predicament. And now their solution is, well, you should just heat one room in your house and stop taking those showers. What do you need showers for? We've got these wonderful inventions called cloths. Just use them. Guys, this is moving backward. This has been moving backward, this energy crisis in Europe. And at first it looked like it's moving back to pre-industrial revolution. Now it looks like it's moving back to the moment Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, where you need to wipe yourself with a cloth and start a fire and huddle around it to stay warm because it's all about survival, just basic survival. Your goal is to survive the winter if you're in Europe. And either these politicians, if they're allowed to stay in power, the, the level of totalitarianism that's gonna come from them is beyond what I can imagine. And they're very likely to give rise to a huge backlash that leads to maybe a populist demagogue who becomes a totalitarian in and of himself, that that's where all of this is leading. It's leading to totalitarianism. The Bible tells us that one man will control all of the world, every people, tribe, nation, and language. It's in Revelation 13. So we know this is coming, and this is all just setting the stage for that. The only question is, will the Antichrist arise from these types of politicians that have created this crisis and have this elitist mindset? Or will he arise as the counter to that, people's backlash against that? I don't know, but <laughs> but this, this is not good. This is not good. And of course, it leads to totalitarianism, which is where we're going. This is from the American thinker. It says, the new epidemic of self-silencing plagues America. A new study by the populist organization revealed the obvious, that Americans are self-silencing, people saying what they think others want to hear rather than what they truly feel. And we come down here and we read, under the guise of being woke, the left is canceling dissenters and rendering them outcast, often by inventing claims of bigotry. Wokeism that claims to emanate from empathy is merely a euphemism for totalitarianism. Absolutely. Again, that's where we're going, guys. The suppression, the self, uh, self-silencing, suppressing your own freedom of speech, being afraid and fearful to speak in public. That's the first sign that we're seeing this totalitarian system come into being. And along those lines, I want to leave you with this Note, I found this, well, I found this humorous. Maybe you disagree with me. But this was on Wall Street Silver tweet, Twitter feed. It says, Klaus Schwab motivational quotes. Never cry about your past. Cry about your future. Because everything is going to get worse. <laughs> so, you know, guys, if we can't laugh about this stuff, then... We're gonna we're gonna pass away long before Jesus comes back because we have to laugh. God gave us laughter. We should use that laughter. We should take advantage of it whenever we can. And God also gave us his son, Jesus Christ, and he is the source of our hope and our joy. So we can smile and laugh in, in the midst of these troubling times with all this terrible news coming out about droughts and totalitarianism. You can have hope because of Jesus Christ. So, guys, make sure to like this, share this, and God willing, we'll talk tomorrow. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, 
Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.